typically one of the things that we're trying to get voice actors to do is to not override their impulse to have ums and ahs, not override their impulse to uh, elongate particular syllables when they're processing or thinking. That sort of elongation that you were talking about is just another one of these cues that I'm not done talking, that I'm still right. processing, that I'm going to say something else. Hello, and welcome back to another riveting episode of Deep Learning with Poly AI. I'm your host, Damien, and I am here with a brand new guest. His name is Oliver Schulson, and he is the senior dialogue designer here at Poly AI. Oliver, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much for having me. Super happy to be here. Of course, it's exhilarating. Oliver was one of the first voices that I heard from Poly AI after I joined a little over a year and a half ago, and uh, it's I'm 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 so excited to have you on the show because one, you are just absolutely persona plus, and uh, two, your field, dialogue design, is such a hot topic right now from a cross industry basis. It's really in demand. Um, good dialogue designers are harder and harder to find, and the question is, what the heck is dialogue design, and why? is in, on the tip of everybody's tongues these days. Give us a little brief about what you do. Sure. So I guess the one, the one sentence summary of dialogue design, or you'll sometimes see it called conversation design across the industry, yeah. is um, we're the owners of the user experience for a conversational dialogue system. Um, and particularly in spoken dialogue systems, like the ones we do here at Poly AI, Mm -hmm. There are so many layers to the user experience and so many places things can go wrong. You know, we have to start with uh, turning the user's voice into text and then processing that text to understand it in some way and then use some kind of internal logic to decide what to do next and then produce, uh, you know, an utterance from the system to respond to what the user said. Um, and at any of those layers, there are things that can go well, things that can go wrong, um, and uh, things that can make for a great user experience or a super frictionful and not a frustrating user experience. Um, and so dialogue designers have a role to play basically at every single one of those layers. Um, but overall, I would I kind of like to say that we're a third product designer, third software engineer, and a third data analyst. So we play a role in the sort of high-level design of the dialogue system, the implementation and the building of it, and then analyzing and uh, figuring out insights afterwards to find areas for improvement, um, look at trends and metrics, um, and come up with ways to make the experience better. Interesting. Data analysis, product design, dialogue design, obviously. this These are uh, some pretty varied skill sets. So what kind of backgrounds do you tend to see with really strong dialogue designers? And maybe what are some consistent characteristics or traits that you find no matter the background that makes for a really effective dialogue designer? I mean, you, you already alluded to it, right? Kind of having those three functionalities. Are, are, are these people coming from backgrounds in product design? Are they coming from backgrounds? I, in our application, it makes a lot of sense, right? But what about in, in the broader industry? What, what kind of backgrounds do the folks who make really good dialogue designers come from? Yeah, so actually every dialogue designer at Poly AI um, has an academic background in linguistics, which is crazy because it's not a huge field academically. Um, <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't a ton of linguists out there. We have all um, of you worldwide. We have every <laughs> yeah. linguist now works for Poly AI. Yeah, and, and I actually I actually came to the field of conversation design through a like career boot camp that was run through the Linguistic Society of America. So I came to it very much through my linguistics academic community. Oh, that's um, cool. Uh, and linguists are, you know, people who study human language per se. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that makes uh, linguistics such a powerful background to have in this field is that it merges um, this kind of deeply intuitive design-oriented aspect of the job where you're sort of being asked to reflect deeply on yourself and your own experiences interacting with these kind of systems and what makes it feel natural. What would I do if I were in the shoes of the customer service representative that I'm kind of trying to embody when I design a, a voice agent. Um, but then also on the other side, we're trained in this very programmatic kind of style of thinking that is based around rules and constraints that really lends itself toward operating within computational systems in general. Um, you know, linguists love rules and constraints. I, I, that's just like where we live. 
Um, and then and- you wear that t-shirt all the time. It just says linguist love rules and constraints. It's like, get a new shirt, Oliver. Exactly. That's uh, that's just where we live. Um, and so, it, you know, basically your job as a linguist is to think about this thing, language, that is so intuitive and so integral to the human experience and something right. that is built into our brains and that no one thinks about but does every day um, and figure out what are the rules and constraints that model and and systematize this process. Um, and so that's basically exactly what you're doing when you are creating a computational dialogue system or an AI dialogue system is right. you are teaching a computer that doesn't have any of the kind of cognitive biases or architecture that we have how to do this thing that we do so intuitively every day but and not only that but you have to make it so it operates as autonomously or not autonomously like well yeah i guess a little bit and effectively so that it doesn't register as something that's non-intuitive to yeah. the corresponding party which yeah. seems to be a task unto itself not only to train technology to do this to train a bot to do this but to do it and have it be received as something that's just as intuitive as it is uh, for 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 human participants. That's exactly right. And I think I think you asked why conversation designers are in such high demand right now. And I think the reason for that is that because everyone has such deep, built-in intuitions about language, uh-huh. it's very easy to tell when something is not good, um, when an interaction doesn't feel natural or doesn't feel sure. human. Um, and so. I think everyone has this sense. We've had this sense for as long as there have been like the notion of a robot, that it would be cool to interact with robots in natural language. I mean, like look at Star Wars talking to C-3PO or whatever. Right. Like, right, right. like, like, like R2 robot... is a different story, but you know, we'll get to that. Well, they talked to, they talked to him in, natu- in natural language, I guess, but <laughs> I guess that's true. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, I say him, I don't know the gender. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I think I think everyone has always felt like, wouldn't it be cool if we could talk to computers, talk to these autom- automatic systems in natural language? Um, but what you realize really quickly as you start to try and make that happen, implement that, is um, thing- weird things happen. And you have these interactions that feel so unnatural, so uncanny, um, but it's actually really hard to put your finger on what the problem is and to affirmatively design a solution to work around that issue. And so I think that's where the linguistics expertise really comes into play. There right. are also you, people who you have... Can't, you can't define yeah. bad art, but you know it when you see it. And it's yeah. the same thing with bad dialogue design. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like if, if something sounds off, you're like, oh, but I can't put my finger on it. And even if you could, how do I correct for it? How do yeah. I how do I code it out? That's a totally different story. Yeah. That's really interesting. So, uh, all right. So... We obviously have a, at, at Poly AI, yeah, we have a lot of linguists that come into play. But what if you're not an academic linguist? Like, what what are some other folks? Like, our authors, our uh, traditional creative writers, our our, our screenwriters, um, you know, any anything that involves high amount of dialogue that just forces you to commit to pen and paper almost what we would do intuitively and naturally in the course of a day to day. Who are some? What are some other skill sets that I think are universal among really solid dialogue designers? Yeah, I think, you know, copywriting or script writing or like whatever is is super huge. I think that the ability to be able to articulate in the abstract what makes an utterance a line natural is different from being able to actually, as you said, commit, put pen to paper, produce something that is going to sound natural and human to someone. Yeah. Uh, there are people who have degrees in human computer interaction that is like a field that is specifically focused on this question and oh. typically those people have experience both in the natural language side the sort of spoken or written dialogue design but also in visual design graphical user interfaces like understanding yeah. how people interact intuitively with computers um so those are some common backgrounds that we see um well i mean what's interesting yeah. about those sort of interfaces is that we, we always talk about how a- anybody can theoretically build you know like a chatbot these days built on a, a a strongly effective and widely available llm right yeah but you lose a lot of the nuances that makes voice such an interesting um yeah. communication medium and so perhaps like the same skill sets that would apply to somebody who has that machine human interaction through various channels probably a little bit easier than voice because voice has certain layers of complexity that come into play that would trigger that uncanny valley sensor a lot easier than something over chat that's exactly Um, or or even as well over visual medium i mean visual is probably on par with with audio but 
Um, that's that's really interesting. So speaking of LLMs and the availability of them, it, it, it seems like right now some of the key players who are establishing some foundational generative models are looking at voice and saying, this is important. Obviously we want to do this. And they're releasing at least, you know, in, in marketing materials, some really like high quality synthesized voices that seem to embrace fairly realistic uh, ability to engage in dialogue. Why can't like, let's say businesses out there that are interested in folding this into their, you know, in, in enterprise tech stack, why can't they just go out and grab an LLM and say, okay, let's make it happen. Is this something that theoretically they could do? Why would dialogue design be necessary in addition to that? So I think you sort of foreshadowed what, what I would say to this before, which is <laughs> when you talked about how like text versus voice, I think that the fact that so many of these LLMs are almost entirely trained on text data um, and specifically like mostly long form text data, like they're getting data from books and from uh, articles and from things like that makes them very good at um, producing text of that kind, which okay. differs in some really fundamental ways from conversational dialogue. Um, and so one of the things that you'll notice if you take one of these LLMs and you particularly try to like get it to perform a complex multi-turn task or transaction um, is that LLMs love to combine steps and overwhelm human processing abilities. Like they'll ask you to do way more things at once than you can possibly remember to do. And okay. that's because LLMs are fundamentally not constrained by human language processing capabilities or human cognitive processing capabilities. And so they don't have any of these intuitions about like what's a logical or rational way to guide someone through this complex task that we're trying to perform together. And so oh, interesting. And so an LLM will- So they just, they just like data dump everything all at once at you. This and is a don't... very common thing. Yeah. So okay. you'll say, you know, I, you know, we're trying to do a hotel reservation. So we need to collect uh, the date they're arriving, the date they're departing, any room preferences they have, the size of their party, um, their name, payment information, and whatever. Um, and as many times as you tell an LLM, you know, take, take your time, do this step by step. Slow a, down. It has a really hard time following that instruction. Um, and I think this is a fun, this is a bias that's built into a lot of these LLMs based around the kind of data that it was trained on, um, but also based around the fact that fundamentally, I think neural networks and the way these LLMs are built differ from the way that humans think. Sure. Um, and so as much as dialogue design is about producing individual interactions or individual turns in a conversation that feel natural, it's also about structuring the entire conversation in a way that works for the human brain and makes us uh, and makes sense to us um, and feels systematic in a way that accords with human thinking. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Like, and, and to your point, these LLMs are typically developed not so much with a voice application in mind, although it is an easy, like, or not easy, it, it is a plausible offshoot, but fundamentally it's, it's, it's a text to text interface, right? So it's looking to give you as much information as possible. You go to ChatGPT and you say, hey, you know, give, build me an outline for hosting a podcast with the Oliver Scholson. Here's his LinkedIn bio. And then, you know, it'll give you a comprehensive framework, but that's not the way that we absorb information when- Not at all. When being like audibly guided or whatever. And so that's that's a really interesting concept is, is taking into consideration how the brain processes sort of like spoken information. Yeah. I, I, I dig that a lot. What are some of the other like little nuanced facets of um, human language that nobody really thinks about? We touched on intuition early on, and I want to kind of go back to that a little bit. What are some of those indicators and 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 components of human language and speech that nobody really considers that dialogue designers have to keep front in mind or front of mind? when developing these complex systems, especially atop, you know, neural networks that process information and deliver information a little bit differently. I think uh, the first one that comes to mind has to do with turn taking and the way that we as humans cue each other um, in spoken conversations that either our turn speaking is not over or it is over and it's time for you to join in. There are also other I'm things. I'm still terrible at that. That's why I interrupt <laughs> everybody on this show. They're well illustrated. Um, there, are, there are little, just very subtle cues that we give, both lexical cues, so things like in the actual words that we say, um, yeah. th either to acknowledge to the person that we've understood what they said, 
uh, to try and interrupt and take over our turn from that from the other person. Um, yeah, these little confirmational markers that we give to people saying, got it. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, you know, continuing into the next piece of the conversation, um, these sort of transition words that make something into a turn taking routine as opposed to just what can feel like a very stilted one question, one answer, one question, one answer. Another huge thing that we tried to, we tackled a long time ago, um, and this is one of the first sort of user experience tasks that I really um, delved deeply into at Poly AI, is this problem of back channeling. Um, this is something that we've been doing throughout this entire conversation very intuitively, where um, if I'm speaking and you want to let me know that you're with me, you're listening to what I'm saying, you're not trying to take over the conversation, but, mm -hmm. uh, but that you're with me, there you go. Uh -huh. They'll give me these little things called back channels, which are things like, mm -hmm, yep. Even there are visual back channels, like head nods, things like that. Interesting. Um, and this is something that um, is so intuitive that people will actually have trouble if you don't give them a back channel at crucial points in an interaction. So, so, that, so that can be a key flag if you're giving a tremendous amount of information to an automated system and it doesn't at some point acknowledge that it's still listening to the information that you're giving and still processing it, you know, by giving that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So uh, a, then a, then we that, that maybe sends off one of those uncanny valley triggers. That's right. So a place that we saw this like all the time is when people are reciting their phone numbers. We have this sort of intuitive um, choreography that we do when I'm giving you my phone number where I will say the area code, then you'll give me an, okay. then I'll say the next three digits and you'll give me a yep. And then I'll say the next four, the last four digits and you'll be like, all right, so I've got- Well, and that's for US-based phone numbers. You know, obviously oh, sure. the, the yes. phone structure and, and sort of the, the condensation of that phone structure in other countries is, is gonna vary as well. Exactly. So, so what we would see so often is people, you know, we would say, could you give me your phone number? You know, the system would say, could you give me your phone number? People would say, okay, it's one, two, three, and then pause. And then, and then the, si a bad system would say one, two, three is not a valid phone number. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Interesting. So being able to give them that back channel and be like, yep, I got that. I'm still listening. Keep going. Um, is a crucial and completely ubiquitous part of human conversation that a computer does not intuitively know to do. Right. Um, and that you have to build in very deliberately. And that's, that's a complex build in too, because sometimes yeah. they are done talking or sometimes, and so, yep. you know, or, or sometimes they're, they're not done and don't want to be interrupted. So the, the eponymous barge and, you know, when is it appropriate? When isn't it? Do you need some yeah. more information or do you just want to indicate through back channel that you are still processing that information or that request or that turn? Wow. That's, that's all right. Anything else besides that back channel indicator that really comes to mind? How about some of the things I, I know I've listened to a few call samples that we've done, um, and, and this is particular with, when it comes to non-synthesized voice, but I am seeing it in more, uh, in more um, in opportunities with synthesized voice, things where certain phonemes are sort of dragged out. The ums and the, well, let me see about that. Or, you know, and I think back to traditional IVRs, I think it's nuanced that that introduced the typing in the background, the clackety clack. And it was like, oh uh -huh. boy, that is about as inorganic as possible. But those sort of add-ons are really nice. Is is that something that you consider? Do you actually like, I hate to break it down to such a rudimentary process, but do you actually like read a script out loud and see how you process the oh, language? Yeah. Which, yeah. Oh, you absolutely. do? That's a, that's, that's a, a key part of making, I think, designing any natural dialogue is like putting it in your own mouth and seeing like role playing with yourself or with your roommate or whatever, like how would this conversation actually go? Fun day um, in the office. You guys are just exchanging different ways to read a scene. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, and you know, when we work with actual voice actors, um, as opposed to, uh, synthesized voices, which we do both uh, in different cases, um, mm -hmm. this, this is the kind of direction that we give them, um, is, Typically, one of the things that we're trying to get voice actors to do is to not override their impulse to have ums and ahs, not override their impulse to uh, elongate particular syllables when they're processing or thinking. That sort of elongation that you were talking about is just another one of these cues that I'm not done talking, that I'm still right. processing, that I'm going to say something else. Oh, good. Um, and, uh, and you need to wait for me. To, to, <laughs> as, as opposed to... As opposed to if I just like, if I just said, so it's like, what is that? But if I say, so 
I think that like that's right. that sort of upward intonation that extent like that's that's telling you that I'm about to go into something else. I'm working on something. Um, uh, hold, please, while I get back to you about whatever I'm about to say. Yeah, because um, contextually you could use so in other circumstances like that's that's so true. And you don't mm -hmm. want to be like, that's so true. It could be off brand. So or the that's use case so... of each individual word. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah, that's 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 really interesting. All right. Um. So we got a couple of flags to to keep in mind when it comes to you want to be a, so you want to be a dialogue designer. Here are the things you need to think of up front. Where is what does the future of this industry look like, especially with the advent of such um, aggressive and uh, functional, um, uh, you know, language systems that exist in LLMs and other applications of artificial intelligence? Like where what does the future of dialogue design mean with these new tools and technologies in play? I think like on the on the one side, it's changed everything. And on the other side, it's changed nothing. Uh, but what I mean by that is, what I mean by that is, you know, on the implementation side, implementing a conversational AI system with an LLM is so different from implementing sort of these more traditional conversational systems where the AI was all on the understanding side and everything that was produced was prescripted or there was sort of internal logic behind it. Um, where in the former, in with LLMs, you are basically trying to constrain behavior and make sure that it only does the things that you tell it to do and doesn't do other stuff. Um, right. Whereas in the on the latter, um, in the more legacy style of, of uh, conversational AI system, every new bit of functionality had to be explicitly designed and built in. Right. However, in both of those cases, again, we're coming back to the rules and constraints. The key task is to make sure that the behavior aligns with the rules and constraints of human interaction. So right. those intuitions that d dialogue designers have, that linguists have, that human computer interaction people or writers or copywriters have are applicable in every case. Um, one, th one thing that you'll notice is that uh, if you spend time interacting with an LLM is that although you can sort of tell it to have a certain personality or a way of talking, it will almost always, particularly when it runs into a um, some kind of challenging problem, revert back to its kind of baked in personality. Right. Um, and it makes it really hard for companies to differentiate themselves on a branding from, from the branding side. And actually, we still find ourselves, even when we're working with LLMs, having to give them a lot of very specific instructions for here's how I want you to say this. Because sure. otherwise, it's going to sound like GPT or whatever LLM it happens to be. Interesting. Yeah. So, so, so in that migration from being able to tell something what to do to being able to tell something effectively what not to do, which is what the the era of LLMs has sort of ushered us into. Yeah. That even with LLMs, there is still a ton of opportunity as the technology sits right now to be able to tell it what to do because often when it gets to certain situations, it will revert to that baseline templated information. And when you're buying an on-brand solution that's facing customers, you need it to stay on brand throughout the entire interaction. So yeah, yeah, that's kind of a fascinating component. I didn't think I didn't think of that well, when it comes to like pros and cons of LLMs versus like structured dialogue design. Yeah, it, it will revert either it will revert in that uh, sort of stylistic way back to that baked-in personality, or it will revert back to its sort of long-form text-based biases that we were talking about before. <laughs> so again, there's like a there's a huge role that dialogue designers still play in structuring a conversation, even when you're working with an LLM, um, particularly when you're doing these kind of complex um, multi-turn tasks. A little bit of language police in that you're trying to avoid unintentional prompt injection injections. I think it that's, that's, yep. that's, uh, that's, that's very wild. I, um, I, you know, it just harkens to the Twitter X, whatever it is, and threads meme now about trying to catch automated bots yep, by having yep. them ignore all previous instruction. <laughs> those just, are very funny. <laughs> you don't want to get those. You don't want to get your voice bot back to uh, back to square one, back to sort of root personality. That would be exactly. disastrous. Exactly. This has been really, really interesting. And I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to pop on the show and tell us a little bit about this utterly fascinating field. Um, you're one of the best. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. And thanks for giving us a little bit of a deeper glimpse into the world of dialogue design. I really appreciate it, Oliver. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. Of course. And for the rest of you, we'll catch you next week for something probably not as interesting. I got to be honest. Anyway, take care and thanks again, Oliver. Have a good one. Mm-hmm.